Hey guys, welcome to my lecture on inotropes and vein oppressors. My name is JD Barringer, and uh, I'll be with you for the next 30 minutes or so. And uh, let's get started. So, objectives. Today's objectives we're going to talk about studying the different choices of phase oppressors. We are going to take a look at their mechanisms of action. We're going to study a little bit of receptor physiology and take a look at some pathophys, pharmacokinetics, and lastly, along with this, we're going to take a look at um, some of the papers, now some studies. Now, I'll let you know there is plausible evidence that is strong in the literature and is also weak in the literature. So I will point them out to you which one is strong and what is weak as well as we go along. So, sympathomimetics and catecholamines, all right, what are they? Well, dopamine, epi, and norepi, they're all naturally produced in the body, and they activate the sympathetic nervous system by doing a few things. Number one, they initiate the fight-or-flight response, and they also stimulate alpha and beta receptors, thus increasing cardiac output and promoting vasoconstriction in the body as well. So, before we get started, first we have to know that cholinergic transmission is mediated by the release of acetylcholine okay and adrenergic transmission is mediated by epi and norepi we talked about those catecholamines that are released through the body norepi is from the post ganglionic neurons and epi from the adrenal medulla all right so effects acetylcholine has in the heart it's going to decrease heart rate by reducing conduction the firing rate in the SA node and increasing conduction throughout the AV node now in the blood vessels you're going to have vasodilation so receptor physiology we all know that there's different receptors in the body that are stimulated differently we have alpha 1 we have alpha 2 we have the beta receptors the beta 1 beta 2 dopaminergic receptors and the V's, V1 receptors as well, okay? So alpha-1, alpha-1, they're lo located in, in the arterial walls, and they induce vasoconstriction when stimulated. They're also present in the heart, and also when stimulated, they lead to constriction of the vascular smooth muscle, splanchnic vessels, thus increasing SVR. So if we don't know what splanchnic is, splanchnic is blood flow to the gut. The alpha-2 receptors when blocked cause vasodilation inhibiting the release of norepi. So let's take a look at the beta receptors. We have the beta-1 receptors most commonly that we know that are found in the heart. Stimulation of the beta-1 receptors of the heart increase rate, contractility leading to improve cardiac performance and cardiac output okay um, increase heart rates from the SA node of course we call that the chronotropic effect and stroke volumes increase of cardiac output and muscle contractility so increased contractility we call that inotropic effect alright continuing with the beta receptors beta 2 uh, the receptors of stimulation causes relaxation of the smooth muscles. Beta-2 activation results in vasodilation. All right. Additionally, the beta-2 results in mild chronotropin inotropic improvement, although these effects are minimal. So they're minimal, but they must be noted. All right. The dopamine receptors, the D receptors, essentially there are seven subtypes of dopamine receptors. They are present in the kidneys, the gut, coronary and cerebral vascular beds. The D4 receptors are identified in the heart, increases cardiac output by improving contractility and heart rate. Now, the, these D1 receptors are stimulated at certain doses. So at certain doses, you're going to get different stimulation and different effects. And we'll talk a little bit more of that uh, later on in the lecture. For example, D1 and D2 receptors, they stimulate diuresis, nitresis in the kidneys. All right? Vasopressin, the V1 receptors, they're present in the smooth muscle and the peripheral arterioles. All right? Stimulation of these uh, V1 receptors in the vascular beds 
tells the kidneys to hold on the water but not to retain salt. This is the natural compensatory mechanism for restoring blood pressure during hypovolemia. So when the kidneys sense that there's decreased flow, then these V1 receptors are going to be stimulated. Now under normal physiological conditions, these V1 receptors stimulated, they promote vasoconstriction, therefore you're going to have a change in BP because of bowel reflex activity. Okay, So the bowel reflexes when pressures are going low, it's going to send a cascade of changes telling the, uh, the V1 receptors to be stimulated hold on water. Now let's look at a case study. You got a 64 year old male, he's got a change in mental status, he's got some flank pain. Vital signs is heart rate 142, pressure 70 over 30, resp 36 and temperatures 41. Foley shows 200 cc's of pus after four serial boluses of 500 cc's, no increase in blood pressure. Now what do you think about this guy? Should this guy scare you? And the answer is probably yes, he should scare you. All right, does this case study make you nervous? Yes, it does make you nervous. And we're gonna talk about how we treat these types of patients. So why do we use vasopressors and inotropes? Well, as we see in this last case study is because of shock, okay? Shock is the impaired tissue perfusion, cellular hypoxia and metabolic derangements that causes cellular injury, all right? Inadequate tissue perfusion impairing cellular metabolism. This is what shock is. Although this early injury often is reversible, persistent hypoperfusion leads to irreversible tissue damage. If we let this go, then we're going to have irreversible tissue damage. It's going to progress to end organ dysfunction, cellular death, organ death, and you know, biological and clinical death. Patients will die. So it's important to note shock is the final common pathway associated with emergencies um, from MIs, sepsis, PEs, traumas, and anaphylaxis. Okay, so we all know essentially what happens. MIs, we can get different shocks like cardiogenic shocks and obstructive shocks and hypovolemic shocks and anaphylaxis. So we'll talk about these different types of shocks later on in the lecture. So right now, types of shocks. So we have hypovolemic shock. We know hypovolemic shock is when um, we have a loss of blood, we have cardiogenic shock, and specifically in this lecture in cardiogenic shock, we're going to be talking about more of left ventricular dysfunction more than everything. We have neurogenic shock is when we have loss of sympathetic tone resulting in decreased SVR and hypotension. We have obstructive shock, PE distributor shock. We have septic shock we're going to talk about. Um, as well. So specifically septic shock, this is what happens. You see this graph. You have a host, therefore, and then we see the infection. We look over to the right, we see SIRS, that's in systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So therefore that's when the inflammation process starts. And then we have the release of cytokines and things like that. And then there's some different um, criteria that are met in order to cause somebody sepsis like uh, white count greater than 12,000, um, temperature. Uh, so after we have that criteria sepsis, patients progress into se severe sepsis and then septic shock. So the major path, uh, path of pathophysiological effects. So here we go. We look on the left, we have a host, we have an organism. It's going to progress. The inflammatory process is going to start diffuse endothelial disruption, release of cytokines, interleukin-6, things like this. Then from that, global tissue hypoxia, organ dysfunction, we progress into severe sepsis, and then we progress into MODS, multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. This is where the refractory hypotension comes in, and then septic shock, and then if none of these get treated, ultimately get in depth. So we have the vasodilation, maldistribution of blood flow, and myocardial depression. So maintenance of adequate systemic pressure for optimal tissue perfusion. This is what we want to try to achieve, okay? We want to maintain adequate systemic pressure to perfuse these tissues because if we look back and see exactly what shock is, is 
inadequate tissue perfusion essentially impairing cellular metabolism. So we want to keep that metabolism going. So therefore, we're, we're not um, causing cellular death. And with that, there is a study that suggests here that essentially says that maining maps over um, 60 is the way to go. Now, a lot of people essentially look at um, look at systolic blood pressures. Systolic blood pressure is not the way to go. Okay, systolic blood pressure is not made to go. So organ perfusion is predicated on MAPS, not systolic blood pressure. Okay, so we have to keep that in mind when we're treating these patients. Okay, fluid resuscitation is the first thing. Okay, of course antibiotics, um, as far as that's concerned first, then we have fluid resuscitation. After fluid resuscitation, we want to optimize left ventricular dysfunction by starting inotropic agents or vasopressors. Okay, so if the fluid is not working, and also in other instances, we may have to start vasopressors early in our stage where we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so continuing, well, we have vasopressors and inotropes. Um, are they the same thing? Well, the answer is no, they're not the same thing. So vasopressors act to increase SVR. Subsequently, when you increase the SVR, you're going to have an increase in blood pressure. Inotropes increase cardiac output by increasing cardiac tractility with minimal increases in heart rate. So we'll talk about what are vasopressors and what are inotropes, okay, and which ones we use more in common practice. So quick mental note. Drugs may have an effect on multiple receptor sites and interactions may be dose dependent. For example, some of the drugs that are dose dependent may have direct blood pressure effects through indirect, uh, may have effects on blood pressures indirectly or directly. Big example of this mental note is dopamine. When dopamine is giving at lower doses, it affects different receptor sites and blood pressure differently. Okay? At higher doses, it affects blood pressure differently by stimulating different receptor sites as well. So we got to keep that in mind before we proceed. Mental note continue. Um, it should be known, like I said before, as I stated in the literature, there's few studies that provide evidence for specific vasopressor or inotroper use in the emergency room and also pre-hospital of shock. So most of these recommendations are based on pharmacodynamic, pharmacodynamic modeling, animal research, and a lot of his clinical experience that um, people have given. Like, um, you know, we can do studies on people and, you know, CT surgeons are people uh, who take people off heart-lung machines and see cardiogenic shock all the time, and we get a lot of clinical experience data from these guys. Um, and also limited human trials in a critical care environment. So we have to keep that in mind that there hasn't been a lot of stuff done and basically are the recommendations of vasopressor use are based off of those modeling. So inotropes and vasopressors. We have phenylephrine, which is neosinephrine. We use vasopressin. We use norepinephrine, which is levofed, epinephrine, dopamine, dobutamine. Okay, so if we take a look, this is an interesting graph, if we take a look at this pyramid, okay, say we look at neosinephrine, phenylephrine right at the top, okay, the more, the thicker the triangle is, if we look at the top of the pyramid, there's more red, obviously, it's, it's, it's wider. The wider it is, that means that the more effect it's going to have on that. If we look at the other pyramid, it's going to have less effect. Obviously, it's inverse. So if we take a look at phenylephrine, neosinephrine, obviously, it's going to have a more effect in increasing SVR. Okay? So that's what this means, a little graph to look at for all the different drugs. So the treatment of shock. So shock is categorized, like we talk about it, again, inadequate tissue perfusion resulting in impaired cellular metabolism, impairment of oxygen and nutrient delivery to the tissue, and the development of shock is associated with hypotension, which ultimately progresses to MODS, multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. So some causes of this shock include cardiac dysfunction, blood loss, autonomic dysregulation, and sepsis. These are some of the three, um, some, some of, not the three, some of the things that happen that the shock 
why we get shock. So the treatment of shock consists of identifying and reversing the underlying problem and correcting hemodynamics. So this is what we can do, okay? Fluid or blood product resuscitation should be the initial management for hypotension. So if we have somebody that is hypotension, the first thing we can do is correct the blood pressure through fluids or blood products. That is our responsibility, okay? That is our responsibility. If that does not work, vasopressors should be initiated to patients with refractory hypotension. If you look back at that case study that I, I gave earlier, for refractory hypotension, he had four serial boluses of 500 cc's. We know he's refractory hypotension, therefore vasopressors should be initiated to restore the blood pressure. Despite fluid resuscitation, um, not working. So in low cardiac output states, inotropes should be considered as well. And we're going to talk about what are inotropes and what they do to the body in our decision of using them. So with that, a quick vasopressor and drug overview. All right. So phenylephrine. So what is phenylephrine? All right. Phenylephrine is selective alpha-1 agonist. So it's going to have Increased blood pressure is going to increase afterload, and it's also going to have um, reflex bradycardia, clinically useful in shock by neurogenic causes. All right, in other states where the SVR is less than 700 and cardiac output is not impaired, all full useful agents in support of hyperdynamic sepsis. Now, how do we know if somebody's SVR is less than 700? The answer is pre hospitally, we don't, unless somebody has a uh, cardiac output monitor on, we're not going to know if somebody's SVR is less than 700, okay? NEO has pure athlete activity, results in venous and arterial vasoconstrictor, minimal direct effects on inotrope and chronotropy. So it's going to have minimal direct heart effects, okay? Causes increase in systolic, diastolic, and MAPS, and can lead to reflex bradycardia. That's very, very important, and this is one of the reasons that NEO is not preferred in some situations. We'll more talk about that. has little effect on heart rate or contractility, so um, arrhythmia potentiation is minimal. So we have to know, if drugs don't have direct effects on heart rate, then, then patients aren't going to be prone to arrhythmias directly. Okay? Remember that. Neo's vasoconstrictive effects have been associated with decreased renal and splanchnic perfusion. Well, we know that since neosinephrine, excuse me, neosinephrine is selective alpha, if it's going to increase SVR, then we're going to decrease renal and, and, and perfusion to the kidneys and to the gut. All right? Contraindicated SVR greater than 1,200. Again, unless somebody's being monitored, cardiac output and things like that, then we know what the SVR is. All right, epinephrine. So epi, potent beta-1 receptor activity and beta-2 also has alpha-1 properties as well. It's an inotrope. It is a vasopressor at high doses. We're going to see effects of increased heart rate, cardiac output, and blood pressure. Now, real quick, um... I'll, 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 I'll name some of these doses of the drugs. Now, each hospital institution have different um, mixes and different concentrations, but I'll go ahead and name some of the um, standard concentrations that people do. I forgot, I'll go back. Neosinephrine, usually standard concentration is 50 and 250, which is 2 milligrams per ml. Okay? Um, epi... You can find it in 2 milligrams and 250, which is 8 mics per ml, 4 milligrams and 250, okay, which is 16 mics an ml. It's usually dosed at 0.5 to 100 mics per minute, okay? Results in increased cardiac output. You're going to have decreased SVR and um, variable effects on the map, okay? Now, let's, let's look at this real quick. Um... The reason why you're going to have some um, decreased SVR is because it has D, uh, beta-2 effects as well, all right? So beta-1 receptor stimulation may provoke dysrhythmias. Again, direct effects on heart rate. Therefore, you're prone to more dysrhythmias, 
greater degree of splanchnic vasoconstriction, okay, of course. So this is our go-to drug in ACLS. We all know epi and ACLS. We're going to use that in cardiac arrest. You'll see management for hypotension, open heart surgery, cabbages as well. Vasopressin. Vasopressin is antidiuretic hormone analog, essentially. It's a peptide hormone whose primary role is to regulate the body's retention of water. So some of the effects, you're going, of course, you're going to have increased blood pressure. You're going to have decreased heart rate. You're going to retain water, water and it's going to decrease sodium. So it acts like ADH directly stimulates the V1 receptors, resulting in vasoconstriction. Thus, we're going to get an increase in blood pressure. Okay, We stimulate those V1 receptors. We're going to have an increase in blood pressure. Your body's going to tell the kidneys to hold on water. Usually released when the body's dehydrated, causing the kidneys to conserve water but not sodium. Often used in a setting of diabetes or syphilis, esophageal varices and bleeding. Okay, we use it in sepsis as well. So one of the thing about the vasopressin, uh, vasopressin is the VAS study, the vasopressin versus norepi infusion with patients in septic shock. And what these guys did is that they wanted to know what is what is um, more uh, beneficial for a patient in septic shock as a first line drug, vasopressin and norepi. Okay, so the study finds that low dose vasopressin did not reduce mortality rates as compared with norepi among patients with septic shock who were treated with catecholamine vasopressin. So essentially, there was no change in people who got norepi or vasopressin initially for septic shock. Okay, vasopressin augments usually um, other vasopressor agents. So essentially, if we have levofed with a norepi on and a patient's not doing any well, we add vasopressin. So vasopressin usually augments other drugs and is most commonly used at doses 0 0.03 to 0 0.04 units per minute. Okay. One thing you have to monitor is um, w when we have patients on, on, on vasopressin is we got to take a look at their fluid status making sure they're putting out urine. Also, the ser serum sodium. Okay, serum sodium is important because remember I told you that the kidneys conserve water but not salt. Okay, norepinephrine, levofed, great drug, acts both alpha-1 and beta-1 receptors. Okay, it's a potent vasoconstrictor as well as less pronounced increase in cardiac output. Now, norepi um, is a potent vasoconstrictor, effects, acts decrease venous return, improve cardiac activity. So you're going to have increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, increased cardiac output, um, alpha and beta agonism with this drug. Um, some of the concentrations you're going to get with um, Levo is 4 and 250. Um, people can go all the way up to 32 and 250 that you'll see depending on institutions. Um, so a lot of neuro hospitals like to, you know, highly concentrate the drug so you don't get too much um, fluid. All right. And um, one of the big things is, is uh, reflex bradycardia usually occurs in response to increased MAP. Now, one thing about norepi. Now, norepi causes more vasoconstriction than epi because it doesn't induce compensatory vasodilation via the beta-2 receptors. Epi has more stimulation on beta 2, so therefore you're going to get more vasodilation on the blood vessels. Okay, this is why um, norepi is not used in asthma patients because it has a weak beta 2 activity. This is one of the big reasons why we don't use norepi in asthma patients because it really doesn't have any beta 2 activity and effects. Okay, you're going to have mild chronotropic effects is canceled out and the heart rate remains unchanged usually or is decreased when we give this drug. Low dosage, about two mics per minute, norepi stimulates the beta receptors, usually beta one. And clinical doses, three mics per minute, norepi stimulates alpha receptors promoting vasoconstriction. All right, dopamine is the drug that essentially everybody knows. It's the first thing you learn in school, dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. Dogenous catecholamine that function as a neurotransmitter and is a precursor of norepi and epi.
okay? So dopamine, you're going to have increased heart rate, positive chronotropic, inotropic effects, and cardiac output. And we must note that the effects of dopamine are infusion rate dependent. All these things that we were talking about before is that dopamine is going to change um, dose dependent. Mediated by dopaminergic receptors and stimulation is dose dependent, the, the, the receptors. For example, when dopamine is bound to D1 and D2 receptors, it promotes vasodilation in the mesentery and the kidneys. And we'll talk about this. Axon D1 receptors in the renal, mesenteric, coronary, cerebral beds, resulting in vasodilation. The use of low dose dopamine for the treatment and prevention of acute renal failure cannot be justified on the basis of available evidence and should be eliminated from routine clinical use. Okay. A lot of places that you go put people on low dose dopamine and the literature suggests that it should be eliminated from routine clinical use. Okay. This is the site if you guys want to um, look more into it. Moderate doses, moderate doses, so the low doses of dopamine, dopamine, we're talking about 2 to 5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. The moderate doses, we're talking about 5 to 10 micrograms per minute. And with these moderate doses, we're going to have stimulation of beta 1. We're going to increase cardiac output by increasing stroke volume with variable effects on heart rate. Now, variable effects on heart rate. Now, these moderate doses, we know now we're starting to have some effects on heart rate, so we got to think of prone to arrhythmias. Higher doses, dopamine, pure alpha, essentially like levofed, promotes vasoconstricting. Therefore, we're going to increase SVR. Now, doses of dopamine, you can have concentrations 400 milligrams and 250, which is 1,600 mics per ml. Or you can have 800 and 250. Okay? Adverse effects. Tachycardia, tachyarrhythmias, like I said, excessive vasoconstriction, again, dose dependent. Increase in myocardial oxygen demand at low doses, again. Reiterating. Now, dobutamine, dobutamine is a inotrope. It is not a vas vasopressor, but rather an inotrope that causes vasoconstriction. All right? Increases cardiac output without significantly increased heart rate, all right? So this is what an inotrope is. It's going to increase contractility, essentially. Augment inotropic activity and perfuse perfusion to the body, especially in septic shock patients with global myocardial dysfunction, okay? Those people who have myocardial dysfunction, we put dopamine on board. We're going to get that contractility, but we're not really going to get increases in heart rate, all right? Predominantly beta-1 effect increases inotropy and chronotropy and reduces left ventricular filling pressure. We have minimal alpha and beta-2 receptor effects resulting in overall vasodilation, complemented by reflex vasodilation to increase cardiac output. Okay, Net effect is increased cardiac output, essentially what we get. We have decrease SVR. One of, that's one of the um, things that we should know that initially you start dobutamine on, on patients, we can get a decrease SVR. So we can initially have a small drop in reduction of blood pressure that we have to be aware of. Cardiac output may be decreased because of a marked increased SVR after load, like we said. So now we know a little bit about these drugs and taking the more conventional approach of saying, hey, if we use, um, let's use Levofed is used for X, Y, and Z, we're going to take a look at the different types of shock and talk about what drugs would we use for the different type of shock. Because identifying the correct vasopressor consists of identifying and reversing the underlying pathogenesis and correcting hemodynamic abnormalities. Okay? Each patient should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, understanding these recommendations, they are categorized by levels, all right? And uh, we're just going to define the levels so we, that when we understand what they mean when we look at the paper. So level one is convincingly justifiable based on available scientific information alone, okay? Strong, strong evidence. Level two, 
reasonably justifiable based on available scientific evidence and strongly supported by the expert opinion. And level three is supported by available data, but scientific evidence is lacking. Okay? Scientific evidence is lacking. So level one is strong, good to go. Level three, uh, not as good. So let's look at the recommendation. For all shock states, they are labeled as level one. Vasopressors should be only initiated with or after adequate resuscitation of crystalloids, colloids, or blood products. And here we have the different type of shock, hemorrhagic shock, level 1, level 2, level 3, septic shock, low-dose dopamine should not be used for renal protective effects. In the level 2 category, they want to maintain MAPS above 65 to achieve adequate end organ perfusion pressure, cerebral perfusion pressure, abdominal perfusion pressures, and urinary output. Also under the level 2 studies, they recommend that levofed is the first line agent when vasopressors are indicated. Epi, neo, and vasopressin should, be, should not be used as first line agents. So in the instance of septic shock, levofed is your first line agent. Vasopressin should be added to levofed to optimize the therapeutic efficacy of levofed. So we're going to continue on. We have neurogenic shock. All right. Physiological, one thing to be noted, due to the physiological nature of neurogenic shock, vasopressors may be initiated earlier to avoid, avoid fluid overload. Now, when we think about what happened in neurogenic shock, remember, neurogenic shock is essentially a loss of sympathetic tone with a marked decrease SVR, thus resulting in hypotension. SVR, if you have an increase in SVR, that means that the vessels are going to be clamped down. A decrease in SVR, you'll lose the tone of the vascular, the vascular tone of the vessels. Therefore, you're making the vessels bigger. Therefore, the blood pressure is going to drop. Okay? Cardiogenic shock, more we're going to be talking about in this lecture of left ventricular dysfunction. Vasopressors and inotropes should be initiated earlier in cardiogenic shock with clinical evidence of volume overload. And we have adrenal fishy, distributed endocrine shock. We'll talk more about these. So choosing the right agent. There are no large super metadata trials or large randomized studies or well-controlled studies that guide the pharmacologic management of hypotension. So th they haven't been done, but they are getting done. And their papers are coming out and coming out and coming out. So we'll talk about what we have, some of the things that I've picked out so far to help us make great decision. So the use generally is based on data from animal studies and poor controlled clinical trials. So the selection, like I said before, we reiterate the appropriate agent should be made on a case-by-case -case basis with attention to the underlying cause. That's why we're going to talk about the underlying cause, whether it's sepsis, cardiogenic shock, things like that, to help us make our decision. So case study. 52-year-old male Complaining of chest pains, vital signs, heart rate 118, blood pressure 82 over 50, respiratory rate 28, temp 38C. He's got S3, heart sounds, JVD, rails halfway up, and a new, new onset of uh, Qs in, the, in V1 through V4 in the 12 lead. Now the question is, what do you do? And also, not only what do you do, before we can understand what, what can we do, is what's going on with this patient? Now... This guy, this guy has primary pump failure. He has a decreased cardiac output. He has decreased coronary perfusion pressures. His MAP is low. If you look at his pressure, 82 over 50, his MAP is about 60. And he's got an increased heart rate. And with the increase in heart rate, he has increased myocardial oxygen demand. This is essentially, this is like a negative cycle that this patient is presenting. And we will talk about this guy's in cardiogenic shock and what do we do. Now... Distributive shock. If you have low SVR, do we use a pure vasoconstrictor? And the answer is, yes, we do, because we want to stimulate the alpha and get some vasoconstriction going on. Low SVR means vasodilation, so we want to try to reverse that um, and stimulate this alpha receptors. Now, cardiogenic shock with this patient that we just had, poor contractility, do we want to use a pure vasoconstrictor? The answer is no. So shock tape, septic shock. Septic shock, the first line agents for septic shock are levofed and 
we can use dopamine, second line. Refractory septic shock, if, remember we said before, if the person's on levofed, they're still refractory, we add vasopressin. And then you could add dopamine or epi. But essentially, levofed, refractory septic shock, add vasopressin. Cardiogenic shock, remember we're talking about left ventricular dysfunction, levofed, we'll talk about that, why? Dopamine is a second line, or and with dobutamine as well. Cardiogenic shock and septic shock, dopamine. Hypovolemic shock, oh, throw the curveball right there. IV fluids, no pressures initially for prolonged use, okay? If somebody's in hypovolemic shock, the first thing we want to do is get fluids on board. Fluids, blood, crystalloids, colloids, we want to get it on board, find out when and resuscitate these people, okay? Shock of unknown ideology, dopamine and neurogenic shock, dopamine as well. We'll talk about that. So vasopressors and septic shock, what to use? Well, first of all, before we know what to use, we gotta figure out what is going on in septic shock. All right, so levofed is more potent alpha-1 agonist than dopamine. And it may be more effective at treating hypotension in patients with septic shock. Now, dopamine may be particularly useful in patients with compromised systolic function, but causes more tachycardia and may be more prone to arrhythmias. And we're going to look at the paper. Third in line, we have vasopressin, 0.03 to 0.04 units per minute only, and may be added to norepi levofed to optimize therapeutic. Um, efficacy of, of the vasopressin. So, cardiogenic shock. If somebody's in cardiogenic shock, they are presented with persistent hypotension, tissue hypoperfusion due to cardiac dysfunction, all right, with adequate intravascular volume or left ventricular filling pressures. Dopamine has been traditionally the drug of choice because of its vasopressor and inotropic activity. But levofed was preferred over dopamine in patients with more severe hypotension due to its potent vasoconstriction. Now, this is pretty interesting. Patients who are in a low cardiac output state and uh, cardiogenic shock, dobutamine may be added. Of course, because dobutamine is an inotrope, you're not going to have that increased mark increase in heart rate, but you're going to have a nice increase in contractility to improve cardiac output. However, dobutamine can cause vasodilation. We talked about, excuse me, a decreased SVR, um, initially correction. So therefore, it should be used in patients with less severe hypotension or in combination with a vasopressor, okay? So this is one of the reasons why we like to piggyback dobutamine on other vasopressors because initially, it may cause a decrease in SVR. And if it's by itself and we have somebody using cardiogenic shock, it may not be the best thing to use on these patients. So this is the dopamine versus epi style. This is a randomized control style, uh, controlled trial done, um, published by the New England Journal of Medicine. And essentially, they took 1,600 patients they studied with no occlusion criteria. So they wanted to, um, they wanted to examine dopamine versus epi, okay, as a first-line drug in septic shock. Okay, so this is the conclusion. Although there was no significant indifference in mortality with these patients, Dopamine was associated with a greater number of adverse events. So they gave dopamine and they gave norepi to these patients that were in septic shock. None of them died more than another with dopamine versus epi, but they found that people who had the dopamine had more um, instances of tachycardias and arrhythmias. All right, no difference in survival more arrhythmias with dopamine, okay? Now, this is the bigger news. If you look at the subgroup analysis, if you like, take a look at that graph to the right, you'll see hypovolemic shock, you see cardiogenic shock, septic shock, okay? The patients who were in cardiogenic shock did a lot better if they received levofed over dopamine, okay? So uh, this is, this is, this is, um, Interesting, because this is in contrast with the American College of Cardiology recommends. They recommend dopamine as a first-line agent, cardiogenic shock. But what they found was in some of the papers they read that 
when somebody essentially is in cardiogenic shock, um, first, when somebody is in cardiogenic shock, they essentially have, um, they, they notice that the, um, they had a release of the cytokine interleukin-6, which they started a sec essentially a second inflammatory cascade during acute ischemia and cardiogenic shock. So this is essentially what happens during septic shock. And this is why levofed was so much more useful than dopamine. Okay. So the question is, how much do we actually understand about how vasopressors work? And, you know, honestly, basically, this may change in a few years. Before, it used to be leave a fed, leave them for dead. And now it's more becoming actually essentially the first line drug and treatment and different ideologies and different areas of shock. So hemorrhagic shock. All right. So progressing hemorrhage accounts for 30 or 40 percent of trauma fatalities and is the leading cause of preventable death and trauma okay these are things that we can fix this is what this is saying and 30 40 percent people trauma die okay in shock hemorrhagic shock now with hemorrhagic shock what do we do we have something called permissive hypotension and this is a strategy to keep the pressure low enough that we're maintaining perfusion to the organs but the patient's really not exsanguinating fast. So with that, it's recommending we keep the systolic blood pressures in the 90s. There's no well-defined MAP goals for these patients in, 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 um, in hemorrhagic shock, but they do recommend, hey, if you keep the systolic blood pressures around the 90s, we are good. The trauma surgeon saying this is exactly what they, what they want. Why? Because aggressive fluid resuscitation is controversial and it's been linked to the worsening bleeding due to the dilution and coag, coag factors, increased blood clots, and dislodgement of existing clots. Treatment is damage control resuscitation. Okay? If they're bleeding out, we want to replace the blood in the fluid and transfuse these patients, whether it's pack reds, FFP, platements, blood products. Okay? We want to treat and um, replace these fluids. So neurogenic shock, so it most often occurs in patients with severe spinal cord injury. We know neurogenic shock, you're going to have um, loss of sympathetic tone resulting in decreased blood pressure, okay? Initial treatment is fluid, of course. We know people with neurogenic shock, of course, we're gonna essentially treat them with fluid. But one of the things that the literature expresses in people with neurogenic shock is that we, the earlier you start the vasopressors in neurogenic shock, the better. Okay, Vasopressors with alpha and beta activity should be initiated to counter the loss of the sympathetic tone. So the vasopressors are typically started after or in conjunction with the fluid resuscitation that we're giving. So we're giving fluid, we're adding vasopressors to it, especially we know it's a neurogenic shock case. So typically the vasopressors are choice or one that has mixed receptor activity, stronger beta agonism, okay? Dobutamine, I mean, excuse me, uh, dopamine, especially being the one, has strong alpha and strong beta. Leave a fed as well and initiated before NEO to stimulate. The reason why they don't like NEO is because NEO causes a reflex bradycardia, okay? That's why neosinephrine is not one of the first line drugs in neurogenic shock. So in closing, a uh, few bullet points here. So selection of vasopressors is determined by the cause of shock and your desired therapeutic activity. Alpha-1 receptor agonists worked on the arterial smooth muscles to cause vasoconstriction, thus increasing SVR. You increase SVR, you're going to increase blood pressure, okay? Beta-1 receptor agonists stimulate myocardial cells, enhancing myocardial contractility and chronotropy. For increased blood pressure, if you, if, 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 you're going to, if you have increased blood pressure, the beta-1 is going to outweigh the beta-2. So you're going to have more beta-1 effects than beta-2. If, if you get small decrease in blood pressure, it's because the beta-2 
has more effect and has been stimulated more than the beta 1 receptors or you're going to get no change of blood pressure and all so that was one thing I wanted to add um, with the beta receptors so norepi has a stronger affinity for alpha compared to beta 1 receptors epi has a similar affinity to alpha 1 receptors as levofed but has more beta 1 activity you're going to have more increased heart rate with epi than you do levofed dopamine's activity on alpha 1 and beta 1 receptors is dependent on the dose remember when we said low moderate and high doses of dopamine you're going to have different effects neo is pure alpha agonist however its activity on alpha 1 is not as potent as norepinephrine because remember what I told you we get the um, reflex bradycardia as well so that's why vasopressin augments the effect of other vasopressor agents and is most commonly used for this mechanism at doses 0 0.303 excuse me and 0 0.04 units vasopressin also targets the v1 receptors in the vascular smooth muscle leading to uh, vasoconstriction of the peripheral arterial beds one thing I wanted to go back to uh, neosinephrine and point out is, is that I, I we kept on hammering about reflex bradycardia and and neosinephrine so what happens is if we take a look at neosinephrine you're going to get re reflex bradycardia because since neosinephrine has strong alpha effects it causes reflex bradycardia Okay, dobutamine is a synthetic catecholamine with a strong affinity for both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors and a 3 to 1 ratio. It exerts its effects primary through the stimulation of cardiac beta-1 receptors resulting in a potent inotropic activity with weaker chronotropic activity. On vascular smooth muscles, dobutamine at lower doses can decrease SVR as a result of a va reflex vasodilation and beta-2 receptor activity leading to significant hypotension okay and uh, that is it that is the end of our lecture that's all folks uh, we thank you for hanging out with me for this session and we hope you learned something and um, we'll see you soon thanks a lot take care